Good day, everyone. The uh, ugly jobs report we got earlier today, um, that still may do little to alter the Fed's plans to uh, tighten monetary policy um, at the next meeting. Uh, that's going to be uh, concluding June 14th. Um, and uh, to underscore that, uh, CME's Fed Watch still is projecting a 93.5% chance of a rate hike. Uh, but uh, the r second rate hike for this year um, is less likely. Uh, I guess that would take place in December. And uh, the odds still stand at around 50%. But um, certainly that could uh, move lower uh, in the coming months, uh, depending on how GDP works, because that's a big, big elephant in the room. GDP, uh, even though it was adjusted higher, it's still showing weakness. And uh, in the past several years, when GDP started to decline, the Fed would just step in and, and uh, lower rates, um, boosting QE. But they don't have that, uh, that fuel in the tank anymore, and their mandate really has been to to uh, to hike rates at this point. If they were to reverse that course, uh, that would certainly uh, let down the market. So uh, it's almost like they're stuck in this tight little corner they painted themselves into um, that they've got to do this. They've got to go forward with their mandate. So it should be uh, interesting to see what transpires going forward in, in over the next, uh, say, couple quarters with with respect to the GDP and um, just global go global growth rates in general. Uh, which still seem to be uh, caught uh, in, in, in a number of headwinds. The numbers just aren't uh, showing the signs of life that uh, all this QE would uh, have been expected to, um, to achieve. Um, and, and speaking of which, uh, you know, we've got a lot of these uh, market aphorisms, uh, you know, such as, sell in May and go away. Uh, we just hit June now. Um, and they don't really hold any predictive value when it comes to making money in stocks or ETFs, you know, what, whatever you're trying to do. There are many ways to skin a cat, but these, these types of sayings are uh, just noise, and they're liable to uh, take your eye off, off the ball. Um, and there's a number of other beliefs which uh, may have worked over a span of time, uh, such as the Hindenburg Omen, uh, but they don't really have much predictive value at, at this point. Um, this omen was uh, triggered on uh, Wednesday of this week, um, and it's triggered numerous times since 2014. Yet the bull market continues uh, higher and higher um, with only minimal corrections. And uh, you know the thing about the, the omen, and it, it makes great headlines, and its two big claims to fame are calling the crash of 87 and 2008. Um, but I would argue that uh, you didn't need the Hindenburg Omen at all for those, for those two crashes because price volume uh, warning signs would have brought you to cash uh, before, the, before the markets crashed in both of those cases. Uh, in fact, in, in, I can't think of a case where price volume so warning signs wouldn't have brought you to safety at the sidelines ahead of um, any major correction. Um, and if we take uh, 87, uh, the NASDAQ, for instance, was down appreciably um, eight out of nine days before that um, Black Fr uh, the Black Monday um, of October 19th. That was the day the Dow Industrials crashed uh, about 22%. Um, so you had plenty of time to, uh, to exit um, and uh, heed your sell stops. Then over in 2008, we had market deterioration, which was well evident in the weeks leading up to the uh, to the slow motion crash. I mean, if you all remember, that's what the media was billing it as because it wasn't an overnight uh, sensation. Um, so the sm slow motion crash, um, which started in September, um, which apparently caught a lot of people off guard, but you had weeks of market deterioration leading up to that. Um, here's another headline we keep seeing is the aging bull market. Um, I touched on that in a, in a pre-market pulse uh, just briefly, but this month does mark the, ele the 100th month since the bull market began in 2009, and uh, that makes it the second oldest bull market in history. Uh, but the problem with trying to use age to time the end of a bull market is that bubbles, these sorts of bubbles can grow to enormous proportions before blowing apart. Uh, we saw this uh, very evident in the 1990s. That bull market started in uh, 1990 and went through March of 2000. And um, you, you all might remember that Alan Greenspan made his infamous irrational exuberance speech in 1997, 
So that was three years before the market actually topped. And if one had actually left the market in 1997 or uh, worse, I remember some were shorting the market in 97 and, and vigorously in 98, they would have missed the most uh, dramatic ascent ever seen in the NASDAQ composite in its history. So if, if you want some form of uh, absolute security in knowing when a major correction or crash will occur, because I know it's tempting for a lot of people to try to anticipate these things, um, or rather predict these things to the day. I mean, you, you, it can't be done. You know, you shouldn't be invested in stocks if you want that kind of reassurance um, or security. You know, it, it's, it's far more reliable to watch for clues in the form of price falling action in leading stocks. Uh, such clues um, have always been evident ahead of these major crashes or corrections, um, typically at least a few days in advance. Uh, I think the 1987 crash was, was uh, probably the least amount of warning, um, one of the least amount of warnings, but it was still, the NASDAQ, like I said, was still down eight out of nine days heading up to that black Monday. Uh, so the warning signs are present and um, your stops will bring you to safety, you know, but to don't try to predict the magnitude of a correction. I, I don't think that can be done. Uh, let it run its course and maybe uh, pick up some short positions in the right stocks on weak bounces as uh, they emerge. I uh, wanted to talk about a a couple stocks uh, from our focus list. Um, Snap is uh, kind of exciting again. It was exciting before, and now it seems like it's trying to set up again. It's uh, it's going sideways. It's the fifth day of sideways action. The volume rate right now is minus 58%. Um, the last time it did this, it went for uh, seven days of quiet uh, volume uh, before it had its the day where it was up almost 7%. Um, so right now, um, you know, maybe it's coiling again, um, and and I wanted to mention that this, you know, to a trained eye who's used to looking at these sorts of setups, the undercut and rallies, and then the volume dry up and so forth, it starts to look more obvious. But keep in mind that most of the market is not really looking for these kinds of patterns. They're still stuck in you know old paradigms. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a repeat of what did happen last week. Um, so it's one to watch. Uh, Bizun, uh, B Balzun, B Z U N. That one um, yesterday touched its 20-day uh, where it could have been bought. Um, it's now attempting to move higher. Maybe it'll give a second chance. Uh, but yesterday was the day if you're going to buy it. Uh, it's got a lot of um, upside strength, as you can see. It's a Chinese, it's a Chinese name um, in a good space. Uh, there was uh, also C C. That was another one that. Uh, was viable at the open yesterday. It was still close to its 50-day, and now it's uh, trying to move higher. Um, COHR had been moving sideways. Uh, these are all ones we've been mentioning as viable, um, you know, when they get close to support. And this one certainly had been close to support for a number of days, uh, kind of trading along the low of its uh, gap up day on earnings a few weeks ago. Um, it's now breaking out. Um, another Chinese name is Momo. That one's been testing. It's 50-day. Uh, keeps knocking on it here. It had a weak earnings report, so there's been a lot of volume to the downside, and it seems like it may need some more time to correct that defect if it is going to go higher. Um, it's a uh, the company is a mobile-based uh, social networking platform over in China, and uh, it is a leader in that space. So on a fundamental level, I think I think it should go a lot higher. It just might take a little bit more time on a technical basis to um, work through the, uh, the, this correction it's had. Uh, and finally, uh, Wix has um, been testing. It's also been testing its 50-day. Uh, the volume has been quieting. It's, right now it's minus 58%, and it's just kind of now seemingly hovering around its 50-day, maybe in a sideways move. Um, it has a cousin stock named Shop, uh, which is showing more strength. Um, and both these companies um, are interesting because they enable uh, people to set up businesses on the web. Um, in the old days, uh, you needed a storefront, a distribution network, uh, and a whole host of other components which were quite expensive to get something going. But today, with the uh, continued vigorous flow of people coming online, these companies are well positioned um, to benefit from the strong wave of do-it-yourself business entrepreneurs. Uh, whether it's a simple online retail shop um, or something more sophisticated. And uh, sites such as freelancer.com also help one bring uh, their business idea to completion. So 
all the pieces are out there on the web, and a lot of people are waking up to that uh, to that knowledge and are starting their own businesses um, um, via these uh, technologies. So at any rate, uh, the market keeps uh, keeps on keeps on with this Trump rally and the QE effect. Um, the QE is alive and well. All the uh, central banks uh, that matter, the foreign central banks, continue to print uh, in full. Um, I think the what was it? The ECB said recently they they continue to. Um, it was soft words. It was uh, we're, we're, we continue to monitor the, the situation, but we're going to continue to print. Uh, the Bank of Japan, I think, has the same stance, and Bank of England as well. So they really can't slow the printing press because the global markets kind of depend on this morphine drip. Um, and if they started to slow appreciably uh, the, the QE uh, drip, then um, that would create a problem for the markets. So their hands are tied. All the, all the central banks' hands are tied right now. Um, and so this bubble, I suppose, will continue to grow. And uh, as we've seen before in past markets, these bubbles can get a lot bigger before they actually actually blow apart. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gil. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of watching the stocks and <clears throat> operating on that basis. So uh, some of the names that I'm watching this morning, you know, it's interestingly, I came in long this morning, Snap and Twitter, and they were up before the open, so I dumped them into that. And now they pulled back. And so it's kind of odd that Getting out was a smart thing to do here uh, at the beginning of the day, and uh, and now I'm laying back, seeing where I might want to come in on these. I, on the snap, I'm not. It's a little. What's the volume rate right now, Dr. K? Minus 58 percent. Yeah, so it's still voodooing, but it's coming in, and it's right down to the 20-day line, which is at 21.05. So trying to see if it settles in. Watching the 6:20 chart, but you can see early on this morning it's trading up around 21.50 and. Of any volume selling you, you see there is probably me, but but by the time it opened up, it was lower and it kept has kept going lower. But you're getting, if you look at the 620 chart now, you can see the uh, you got a MACD stretch and cross, so you might be getting close to a spot where you could uh, get in. So I'm watching this right now. I don't have any of it right now, uh, and we'll just see how that plays out. Another one that looks interesting, we don't really talk about it much, but I still think it looks kind of interesting. It's more of a Louis, possible Louis setup. So you've got, there's the L. And if it comes around and forms a U, it becomes a Louis, but you don't know that ahead of time. All you can do is watch and see how the thing pans out. And for now, what you've been seeing is, uh, what he shows a volume right there? On Twitter? We got minus 46. Yeah, so it's down around voodoo level. So this one's kind of pulling in, and I think it's setting up to go higher. If the market goes higher, I think this will go higher. So I've, I've been in this thing and trading it. When it shoots up, I sell it. It comes in, and I'll buy it off the support, like off the 20-day line, and it bounces off. And it comes up to the top of the range this morning, pre-open, and we're trading around 1853 bid. And there was a pretty persistent buyer there this morning. I just kept hitting them until I was done and he disappeared or she disappeared or it disappeared. Maybe it was just an Elga sitting there. I don't know. But in any case, uh, I think it's kind of odd that, you know, the stocks I was long this morning, I dumped when they were up. Light's another one. Data is another one. They were up and actually Data's still up. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, and they're down, so now I'm actually in a good position to see if I want to buy them. Another one I like here is uh, Nutanix is kind of interesting. This is an ugly duckling setup. You have a, the gap up move here, and you'll notice you're kind of sitting in there uh, pulling in. Let me blow this up. And this is a hot IPO, if you guys remember, and it had a big move You know, right after it came public. Boom, two days up, and that was it. And it broke down. It had a notice here you had an undercut and rally move, and that was a tradable move, and you actually got a nice pop out of that. And uh, let me see here. Going back to Snap here. Give me one second.
Yeah, that big blue bar, that's me. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, where was I? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I think yeah, probably you're going to take a shot at Snap here, use the low of the day as a stop. But, you know, how much room is there? A dime down to uh, the 20-day exponential. If I got a, a MACD stretch and cross, then guess what? I'm going to buy it. Uh, hold on a second here. I'm still here, just doing some trading. <laughs> uh, let's see, where was I? Dr. K, what's going on in the background there? Looks like you're having a. Sounds like you're having a party down there. No, it's construction. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so I think watch. I think probably you got a low in snaps, and now just come in and load the boat. That's what I just did. And if it breaks twenty one oh five, I guess I'm gone. But you know, live action. By the way, whatever happened to Turtle Man? I, I kind of miss him. Let's see. Tweeter is. Uh, let's see. That's how I heard someone's maid saying to me, "Are you on Tweeter?" <clears throat> Let's take a look at this. You got a MACD stretch and cross, but notice here. So you, this your six period's coming up to the twenty period. It hasn't crossed yet, but it looks like it may be on the verge of crossing. You notice here though that this looks like it might want to cross below. So you kind of watch this, see how it holds, and uh, let's see here. You could probably <clears throat> probably take up some shares here and look for a look for a six twenty cross now and then look for this one to to hold uh, above so this looks okay. And getting back to Nutanix, I actually own this one. Uh, th now, sorry, I got a little bit sidetracked there. But perhaps Dr. K can give us an update on the two models. I don't really understand why yeah, sure. an update on them, but uh, let me just go. I'll let you go. Let me, I'll let you come on after I deal with this, okay? But here's what you're looking at on this. So Nutanix is, uh, had two gap-ups, one here, one here. This one came after earnings. They, they announced that they had a few big new customers, and, uh, and so the stock gaps up on huge volume. So there's not a lot of short interest in the thing. The way, I think there's about 7 million shares as I counted it the last, on the last report. You can double-check that. But the other thing to look, at, look for here, okay, it have put a 19 low in. So I'm going to test this out as a bottom fishing Bible gap-up, okay? So... What I do then is come in, take some shares. If it breaks 19, I'm gone. That happened on Monday because on Monday we just got, or is that Tuesday? Well, Tuesday, yeah, the first day of the week after the long Memorial Day weekend. And so you got heavy volume, and it looks ugly, and you're going to say, oh, I'm not going to deal with this. But you get stopped out at 19, boom, you're gone. Okay, now you, don't, you have cash in your hot little hand, and you can think about how this might set up otherwise if the, uh, if the uh, Bible gap up, it fails and it fills the gap because notice here it fills the gap. It hits a low of uh, what do we get in here? Low is uh, 1785, so it's undercutting the high here, which would be uh, 1794. So you undercut and fill the gap, okay? And uh, and then so you hold. So that becomes an alternate entry point. And if you come in on that, then you're probably using at the at the most the 10 day or the 20 day or the 50 day as your stops, all of which are just below the stock. Okay, so this to me looks kind of interesting, and uh, and especially along the 10 day this morning. So uh, you had a nice move yesterday, but it seems like it's just uh, settling in and getting ready to turn higher. So I kind of like this, and if the closer you buy to 18, the better. And using the 10 day line at 17.91 as your selling guide, I think this is viable. So there you go.
Um, let's take a look at another one that I'm interested in here today. If I see anything, you may see me start buying a bunch of it. This Momo is holding at the uh, just under the 50-day line, so it looks like garbage, right? And uh, you don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Okay, uh, I can understand that. But of course, this is this market is an ugly duckling market. So you undercut this low, and you're trying to undercut and rally. So what's this low here? This low here is 37.32. We're trading 37.57 right now. So watch as this thing comes in. This is what it looks like on the uh, 620. So it's getting tagged a little bit here uh, with some selling. And it could just bust, but I think you watch it here. If you clear the 50-day line uh, back to the upside, then you have a moving average undercut and rally. That's happened a couple of times over the last few days, and each time it's failed. So, you know, it's even looking weak, okay? It, does, it doesn't look very appetizing here uh, because it looks weak. But all, all this could turn out to be is a Louis formation and... Uh, and so, you know, you're just watching to see how this plays out. Now, your reference in terms of managing your risk becomes the 50-day line. So if it pops above the 50-day line, then you're all over it. And if it goes back below the 50-day, you can blow out or you can give it another percent or two on the downside, depending on how you want to handle the trade. So, But there's very concrete ways uh, to approach this, in my view. So anyways, let me check out the mess I have here. Okay. Well, those are all working. Okay. Nutanix is popping up. I like I like the stock, so you know I'm long it off the lows off the 10 day line, so it looks good here. Uh, Snap, I think it's going to look ugly before it looks better because I think what happens here is that it becomes a little bit too obvious on the uh, you know the fact that you're getting this excessive voodoo. What was the volume rate yesterday? Like minus 73 percent? Yeah, and it was just really tight. But today you got a similar yeah. thing. Yeah. And it's getting, it seems like it might, you know, last time it took seven days. Right now we're in the fifth day of this low volume dry up move. Yeah. Um, so, you know, who knows? It might take a little longer than before, um, but it, it's constructive um, just because of the quiet, tight action. Yeah. So anyways, you want to go ahead and, and go through the models real quick? Yeah, there's not a whole lot to say. I mean, we got an uptrend. We're in the middle of an uptrend. The mar market direction model is on a buys, and the uh, VVM is on a sell. Um, as you all know, VV, the vol vol VVM is selling volatility, so it's anticipating a rising market. And uh, this market, since the Trump election, has been, again, um, a different kind of market <laughs> uh, in the sense that the the uptrend is kind of a baby stepped one and there's minimal corrections. The volatility overall is reaching new lows, um, which is not surprising. It seems like it's establishing a new trading range uh, between maybe, well, definitely between 10 and 11, but possibly between 9 and 10. Um, if you look at like a, a monthly chart of the VIX, you'll, you can see that it, uh, it will do that at, at points. Um, in 2006, it went. Uh, it started trading between nine and ten for a couple months, um, and that's just because the markets were in a very uh, nice uh, uptrend um, in the in the later part of 2006. So that seemed to coincide well with uh, a lower VIX. And right now, it, uh, obviously, the markets have been in a, in a fairly tight uptrend. Um, though you have uh, some great swans that have been thrown at the market. Um, and, you know, we had the day where the VIX was down the most, or one of the most, I believe, in its entire history. Uh, and that was on the basis of uh, the French pre-elections where uh, the markets gapped higher. Uh, and it wasn't a big deal in terms of what stocks and major averages did, but it was a big deal in terms of the VIX because, like I said, it was down, I think it was the third worst down day in history. Um, so that's, you know, that can create uh, turbulence for the uh, VIX volatility model. Uh, we also had the uh, Trump... Uh, impeachment issue come out um, and then that just evaporated just as quickly as, as it surfaced. Although I would say that um, it's not going to go away. I'm sure the, <clears throat> call it what you <clears throat> call it what you will, the deep state or the status quo, whatever, they, they don't like Trump and they like to, they, they want to make sure that they can either control him or, or eject him. So they're not going to let this go. I'm sure they're going to look for every nook and cranny to um, unseat him. Uh, whether it's uh, forcefully uh, by legal means or unseat him in a ceremonial way where he just doesn't have much uh, much control or power. Um, so that's one possible headwind in the future. You know, we've got a bigger headwind, which is the uh, QE bubble, the sovereign debt bubble. Um, and 
Gil and I were saying earlier this uh, before the broadcast, um, you know, is it going to be a, a, a big uh, blow-off top, climax run, um, and, and then an explo explosion, or is it going to be, you know, what's going to happen? Is it going to just be a, a whimper, then an explosion? Who knows? Um, you just got to watch your price volume action. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, markets continue to in their ascent here. Uh, maybe we get some acceleration uh, because there's more and more complacency and more people start to throw their um, hats into the ring. And, uh, you know, like we've seen in other, mar near mar other market tops, you know, the saying when your taxi driver starts to talk about the stock market, it's time to exit. Uh, we're, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, who knows? We could get into that phase again. And in the meantime, might as well enjoy the uptrend and uh, keep your stops tight. Um, and, uh, you know, the models, of course, do accordingly. It's interesting here the, um, that the Russell, uh, which has been lagging, as you can see, sideways moves since November. Um, and uh, the, the TNA, um, e, uh, we had that as a 3x ETF, and as, as has been described um, for the basis for keeping it on there, which is to show you the difference between uh, an ETF that can't really perform very well, or there were moments where it could outperform, but there were moments in the last few years it's completely underperformed. Um, and that shows the importance of ETF selection um, when, when choosing, which is why we uh, provide some guidance, some generic guidance in terms of what we think will um, outperform um, based on the current signal. Uh, but the Russell now for the second day is trying to play catch up with the rest of the market, so that's good. I mean, Russell is a, more, a broader index of smaller cap risk on names. So, um, you know, this, this is a, a good sign. And, of course, the FANG stocks continue uh, on their path. Um, you know, if you look at a general weekly chart, these things uh, just uh, keep on keeping on. Um, not much sign of, uh, of, of an issue um, in these patterns. Not, not yet, anyway. No, not at all. So I really think that what you've got going on here is you, you have a weak jobs number today, and it's just uh, it's kind of like, okay, is a weak economy the big issue? And does that win, or is it just QE going nuts? And I think that's really the key here, is that QE is going nuts globally, even though the U.S. is uh, – you, you were, we were talking about this earlier, Dr. Kane. You are saying that people argue with you that the U.S. has stopped QE, but you argue uh, differently based on the fact that all the liquidity is still there, and it's being added to at a record pace by uh, central banks around the globe besides the U.S. Is that right? That, that's correct, yes. And uh, this is um, something I put out uh, about a year ago um, in, in, in reference to these, these articles that were saying that, you know, the QE has ended in the, in the U.S., so what's going to prop the markets? And the answer is quite simple. It's all the QE from all the uh, other, other central banks because um, everything's interconnected. You know, no, nothing's an island. And so when you get all this money flow from other central banks, it finds its way into the U.S. markets simply because of the, the U.S. markets are the best game in town. Yeah, and that seems to be the case. So, you know, stocks are the new bonds, I guess. And, and I think with the Russell breaking out, uh, if we kind of shrink this, it's, it's, this is uh, showing that because it was lagging earlier in the week as the NDX is just streaking higher. And now you have it catching up and moving back to the highs ready to break out. That's a strong sign that the rally is, is broadening. And I think that's good for uh, – just a general environment, as well as the fact that you're seeing it in leading stocks. There's a lot of names that are showing uh, strength in here, and they look pretty good. So let's see. Somebody's asking a uh, one of these questions. The 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 um, the format is: Does X concern you? I'm concerned by the fact that Jupiter is uh, aligned with Mars and Mercury is in retrograde. That's really very concerning. Um, overhead in the pattern, you know, that when these stocks get oversold, that doesn't prevent a huge uh, move from potentially developing. So I don't pay attention to it. You know, it's like if you just came out of an IBD workshop and they're telling you that, oh, overhead is, is a problem. Well, I think if you look at this this chart, this is my HGS investor chart. And one of the things that I watch for are uh, these gray oversold bars. You see them, these big gray oversold bars. I'm doing a great job of and what it's telling you, so I've got one, one here and one here, and then sort of a cluster here. So I've got three distinct clusters. If I want to squint at it a little bit, you can see it that way. 
and it's gotten fairly oversold. And notice when it started to look as ugly as it could here uh, on heavy selling volume, that's pretty heavy selling volume that day, it turns right around and posts a bottom fishing pocket pivot and clears a 10-day moving average. Boom. Then you get a, another gap up move. Then you have an even bigger gap up move following this one. That's the, on even heavier volume. Okay. So this thing's in play on the long side. Everything's turning blue. And all I need to worry about, and this is why, you know, you're probably a newbie, but I think the question like, does this concern you? Does that, that's like for idiots, okay? Just watch what the stock is doing and go by what the stock is doing rather than finding reasons to scare yourself, okay? I can handle this trade in a very concrete manner, and I went over it earlier. And basically the idea here is we already got blown out on the bottom fishing Bible gap up. Okay, no big deal. Uh, and that was here. Let me make this even bigger. Um, and so now you can kind of get a better view here of this. Let me show. Let's see. What's, now this will have to work. Anyways, but you get blown out on, on this. And I, the other thing I was watching was, it, see the 65-day exponential moving average? That's this thin line I use here. It was trying to hold that. Once it can hold it on uh, Tuesday, that was kind of like the sign to just go away and let it settle in, and it did, and you filled the gap, okay, and so you buy it near the gap fill, and what's your stop? Well, you can use the low at 18 or 1791, I think it is, or the 10-day or the 50-day or the 20-day if you want to, but you just take the shot, you know, it's like, I don't understand why people want to find reasons to get scared by concepts that really, in an ugly duckling market, are totally pointless. You know, it's like you just came out of an IBD workshop, and they told you, like, oh my god, you don't want to buy stocks off their lows, because... Uh, you know, there might be overhead uh, supply, you know, kind of like uh, if you, anybody who was on the webinars at the beginning of the year remembers when we were talking about Tesla uh, down at around 190, well, around two, 210, you know, and it was coming around on the roundabout. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's all kinds of overhead supply right there, right, and over in the pattern over here. So it's, it's just a terrible thing. You don't want to buy it. But it comes out of here, and you actually had a bottom fishing pocket pivot way down here there it is and there it goes and all this overhead oh my god it, it really wasn't a factor at all so if you're going to sit there and scare yourself out of a trade because you you see overhead just forget it this is a different type of market this is not your father's ibd can slim market although there are stocks at work uh you know using the formula but there's a lot of things that have huge price moves as they're rounding out the lows of the bases. And so I don't know. The, the short answer to all that is no, I don't worry about the overhead. I just watch a trade. If I have a concrete trade where I can define my risk very tightly, guess what? I'm going to take it. And Nutanix moving higher. So I also like the moment. It looks like it's starting to move here. Let's check this out in real time. Live action. Uh, where are we? We're still, where is that 50-day moving average? 37.76. So... Uh, I'm going to add an alert. 37. So you're only like a dime away. Okay. So I, I'm going to guess if the market stays up, this thing will go higher. But we'll see. So and we're also not getting any love from Snap yet. It started to push. And uh, here's what it looks like right now in the 620. Uh, back at the lows. So, I mean, it's right back to where I started buying it here, and I just popped it. And it seemed like, you know what, what I thought was weird is I just popped off a couple of it, like 12.13, or 21.13, rather. I'm getting, being dyslexic here. That's a 21, not a 12. At 12.13, I pop them off uh, and buy a bunch of shares. And the thing I like about Snap is you just come in, and you can set it to 7,500 or 10,000 shares, and boom, boom, boom. You're, you're, you're big in the stock very quickly, and it doesn't budge. But it seemed like after I took a couple of those, uh, I think I was popping 7,500 off on two clicks, then all of a sudden the offer just lifted. And it's like the algos all came rushing in because they saw a buyer just taking stock at 13, 14 cents. So, you know, we'll see what happens there. But I think it looks okay. And we'll see if it holds the lows. So now my reference here is the lows. You don't have... Um, well, this was nice. It didn't really hold the 20 period, but you are holding along the low. So I'm, I'm still long this. Like I said, 21.05 will be where I look at dumping it. But it's like, you know, that's 10 cents away from my entry, less than that. So Nutanix pushing higher. So it's a good thing I wasn't worried about it or concerned about anything this morning when I bought it a lot lower than it is now. So anyways. Somebody says, love your gold bar story. It probably, yeah, I have this 10-ounce gold bar. When I was at O'Neill, and it's an actual 
gold bar. You remember that gold bar, Dr. K, I used to keep on my desk as a paperweight, 10 ouncer? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and I used to leave that on my desk, and it used to stay there overnight. You know, the janitors would come in and, and, and leave it there over the week, and it just held down. I had charts and stuff on my desk, so I just put it on top, and a 10 ounce gold bar is a very efficient paperweight, let me tell you. Uh, but everybody thought that, you know, okay, go and be stupid enough to leave a 10-ounce gold bar on his desk. But I was, uh, or maybe I was smart enough to, who knows. But uh, people thought it was just a well, little bar. It was only worth about, about 4000 back then. Yeah, it wasn't worth Maybe that's the other thing, four, four measly grand, especially around 2000 when everybody had just made tons of money in the 99 bubble market. Anyways, um, so on that, we can segue into the gold chart. I still have that thing, though. Um, I use it to, to kill uh, small insects that occasionally wander into the house. We get these crickets once in a while that wander, and I, I hit them with that, and they're done. Uh, but the gold looks okay to me. It looks like it wants to go higher, and I think with a, a weaker uh, jobs number, that's kind of telling you the Fed could be one and done. And there, there are there are kind of waffling. Would you say they're waffling a little bit, Dr. K, in terms of uh, raising rates? Yeah, they have to. They're walking that super tight, uh, well, they're on a tightrope, <laughs> and they've got to balance really carefully here. Yeah, so I think, Through you know, I like, I like gold here. I'm, uh, I'm long it, so, and I've been long it for 17 years now, so, you know, I, I probably am bullish on it, but, I, you know, I've been sitting with it for a while, but I think here I like some of these stocks, and I'll go long these as well. I like Franco Nevada. Uh, is an interesting name, and uh, I think I like it close to the 10-day line, so I thought it was viable uh, earlier in the week along the 10-day line or even down along here, but it, you have, I would call this a pocket pivot off the 10-day line. The reason is because even though this is a higher down volume day, it's actually a supporting day, so I view that more as pos positive, so I'll actually make an exception for something like that, okay? Uh, and I'll just say, okay, that's a pocket pivot, but I want to buy it as close to the 10-day line as possible. And I like this one because they're they're a pure play on the price of gold for the most part. They own royalty streams and production streams of gold rather than mining it themselves. What other company does that remind you of? Well, Silver Wheaton, which is now Wheaton. Uh, uh oh, what did they change their symbol to, Dr. K? Silver Wheaton. I think they changed their name right to Wheaton something or another. Uh, Silver Wheaton. Um, they're now WPM. Okay. Yeah, so it's now wheat and precious metals. So they're silver, mostly silver. Now I would say the the Franco Nevada also they I know they say on oil interests, they own streams of production in oil, and they own some silver. And uh, these guys are mostly silver wheat and is so so a similar type of business model in that they they reprofits from the royalties and the production streams that they own without having to uh, deal with the expenses of running a mine, which can be vague uh, at time in terms of, or you know, negative if oil prices are rising. Oil prices have been low, so that's that's uh, been a positive. But, you know, that brings to mind in the Voodoo Report over the weekend, I was looking at some of these names like Keen Group, which is a reincarnation of an old oil services group uh, company, Keen Group, KEA, I think was the old symbol back in the 90s when I used to trade oil stocks and it's an uh, it's a recent reincarnation so you can see that it's a really ugly pattern here it's along the lows but you had a big pocket pivot coming up off uh, through the 50-day line uh, on decent volume that's a pocket pivot uh, and now it's drifting in I, you know you wonder and, and I've been talking about this in the voodoo report is I wonder if these oils are ever going to get turning around and because and, they qualify as massive ugly ducklings they're ugly as dirt or poop, rather. It's not that ugly. Uh, anyways, uh, and you've got this other one, sand, uh, which is still looking like poop. Uh, silica, still. But see, this one looks like it might be trying to round out a low here. Let's take a look at this on HCSI. And you notice you're starting to get some flashes of blue in here. You had a, a kahuna there so you know you're coming along these lows it's, it's sort of a white coffee and retest of this low and didn't quite get there you get a pocket pivot move here but it doesn't it only clears the five day that's that little blue line I got you can barely see it uh, going on so anyways um, let's see where are we Dow's up 65 Nasdaq up 4339 these big stock Nasdaq names just keep on rocking man this is crazy uh, 
But let's see what's going on. Tesla, David Einhorn was out this morning saying that Tesla is totally mispriced. And I agree, it probably should be 400 bucks. Uh, nice breakout, looking good. Uh, somebody says, do you sometimes target stocks that have a high short interest? If so, what is the best approach to get good data on that? Uh, if you have MarketSmith or HGS Investor or any other analytics program, it'll show you where the uh, short interest or how much short interest there is in terms of days of average volume. And otherwise, you can go to the NASDAQ site for NASDAQ stocks volume. That's a good, good, uh, good source for that kind of data. Uh, sometimes it's really helpful to go after them when they have high short interest. And some examples are like going back to uh, last year. This is a good, uh, last May, you had a nice Bible gap up, a bottom fishing Bible gap up here in, uh, in Amberella, and it had huge short interest. But, you know, if you scared yourself out on this one at that time, it was down here, uh, you know, you'd worry about all this overhead supply, and it just plowed right through it, so... Don't, I won't worry so much about overhead. That's that's uh, kind of an outmoded concept because you have a market that's highly rotational. And Nutanix is cruising. It's going to go back above 19. Go, baby, go. Uh, let's see. Goose got loose. Goose got goosed, actually. How about Mule, you guys? Anybody pick that one up? You know, I talked about it last uh, couple, three weeks ago when it was down along these lows, and that's moved up. Now you're back to the 10-day line. And that uh, had a nice little move. And if you, you could have traded, if you guys were listening last week, I was calling Yex. He's trading about 13.12 at the time, calling in an undercut and rally. You could have got a beautiful three- or four-day trade before earnings, which came out yesterday after the close. You could have sold it. And now they're pum pummeling the stock. So that's the end of that. Um, but that said, you know, that, that was a nice move. And, uh, and Goose is another one. <laughs> Oh, man, look at this thing. Uh, it's a little bit wild, though, because it is pretty volatile intraday, and it's all over the place. Some other ones that I think are – let's see if I'm going to get these right. No, that's not it. Alteryx. Uh, hold on a second. Got to check my uh, – <clears throat> my selected uh, – is it AYX? That's it. Yeah, Alteryx, that's an interesting one. That one's been hopping. But I think something like this, I think it has a, a compelling theme, and you pick it up on, on the lows. Cloudera is another one. It looks similar. You pick it up on the lows. Appian is another one. That's a hot stock. Whoops. There we go. And notice how that's forming a nice little flag. Seems So what's the average volume on that thing? Do you show anything? Okay. No. Uh, it's only traded a few days. So, yeah. so I mean, a million eight wow. is the average. So it's got to settle down. I mean, it's trade today. It's trading one hundred sixty-five thousand. Yeah, so it's pretty light, but it looks like it's in a little flag formation, and it might want to go higher. So, keep an eye on that one. Let me. Whoops. I think that the theme is pretty compelling from what I've heard. So. Anyways, uh, bu, 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 AYX, thank you. Yeah, I got that. I should have just look there. Okay, where are we? I'm watching Momo. Let's take a look at Momo. So I did buy some shares here just because it's coming down along the lows. You got a little tail. I don't know. We'll see if it holds. If it doesn't, just puke it. But it looks okay. I don't know. It looks like it might turn here. Notice how it's, you, you've got... Here's another way I interpret the 620 chart. You've been coming down. You have the MACD cross here, okay, and that coincides with that top. But at, the, at that time, the 6 period was above the 20 period, so it's not a MACD sell signal. But it is a short-term kind of cautionary sign. You get a pullback, and now you're coming in, and you're sort of stretching to the downside. So now you'd be watching for a MACD stretch and cross. Wouldn't be surprised if you got it if the market uh, is able to continue higher. And right now, what's our volume rate? It's running kind of light, right, Dr. K? On the uh, lighter than, I think we're lighter than yesterday. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, but, but you, know, you just go with the setups, and if you buy anything, you just know where your stop is. So on Momo, I'd probably use like 37, 23. I think one of these lows is right around there. Anyways, uh, where were we? Any more awesome questions? Anybody want to ask me what I'm concerned about? Uh, let's see. Mule, there's... Uh, Take a look at these others. Quant Quantena. That was looking like a dog. Now, see what happens here. Whoops, wrong symbol. Once it starts to look really ugly, 
Okay. See, it's looking great here, looking strong, pocket pivoting, big volume. Then it just kind of fizzles out. It comes down to this this uh, low here. And it actually undercuts these lows and comes on top of this little structure right here. And it finds support there. You get big volume, boom, back above the 10-day line. So you want to be watching these things when they look ugly. Because a lot of times when they look ugly, that's, and you can find a reason to buy them. That's the time to buy them. So here you could have found a reason which the first reason is this looks but ugly, okay? There's your first criteria. I don't know if you can screen on that data item, but but ugly is usually uh, what you're looking for, okay? And uh, you get this uh, pullback holds tight, the volume dries up. So, you know, you're getting some sense that it could be holding. So if you wanted to buy it here, you could buy it here and then use the low of one of these days as a tight stop, maybe, maybe down to 1850 if you want to give a little more room, okay? Uh, and then you could come into it. But those are the sort of setups and entries that you have to be looking for. And that's one of the reasons why when I see Momo lose its Momo, and of course everybody sees now that it's lost its Momo, and everyone's going to say it. They, everyone loves to tweet about it, especially me, uh, you know, because it's a cutesy pun. Momo has no Mo, Momo, you know. So you can get into tongue twisters too if you want to with the Mo's. But in any case... Uh, <clears throat> I think you're in a possible, let's see what's the low here, 37.32. So you're in a, you're actually in an undercut and rally right now because you're holding about 37.32. So that would be your stop. That's what I, see, I was being dyslexic again. I said 37.23, I meant 37.32. I'm just flipping the three and the two around. Again, it's pretty typical for me, but, uh, <clears throat> Oh, I see you're pitching one of your stocks again, JT. Okay, I'll, yeah, yeah, it's setting up. I mean, I'm not going to say it isn't. It's just nice and tight. I don't know what it's going to take to get it out, but it looks okay. All right, where were we? Um, NTNX CEO will be on Kramer's show tonight. Thanks for that. That's good to know. Load up, baby. It's the stock's going to go to the moon. <clears throat> here, let me buy another 20,000 shares here. Stay out of my way. Remove women and small children from the room. Here we go. All right. Um, well, Momo, not very, not much Momo for Momo, huh? It's starting to break lows. I don't like that. Let's see if it holds, though, I think. <clears throat> the, the big one, though, now, uh, Bowsen seems to be, yeah, that's kind of stalling, too. But I, this one you'd buy off the 20-day, definitely. Uh, you look at the other Chinese stocks like Baba, that's holding on with 10-day line, so that looks okay. Uh, you look at um, JD, and that's holding along, and that almost looks viable here because you're pulling in, and uh, you know the volume, you're coming in like this, uh, holding along these lows, and the 20-day exponential line, the volume is drying up. Is that drying up today or not? Minus uh, seven percent. Uh, yes, yeah, not really. So. Well, it's minus seven. What I notice is that that minus seven percent, if it's on the downside, it tends to go more negative by the close. Okay. So probably not gonna. It's definitely. I don't think it would beat out let yesterday's volume. So it looks like it'll be noticeably shrinking. Maybe we'll get a couple okay. more days like that. It'll be awesome. Set off off the uh, twenty day in that case. Let's look at Weibo also. Watch this along the 20-day. I think that's probably your entry. Some of these have had huge moves, so they're gonna need to take some time to settle down. So. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily, if I owned them, I wouldn't run screaming from them if you're trading them for intermediate moves as opposed to swing trading because you could have gotten out of here. I think I looked at some uh, candlesticks uh, on these. You can see there's some resistance along here. It's not, you know, 100% certain. NVIDIA had some, and then it came in a little bit, and now it's kind of just plowing higher. This stone probably needs to pull back. Uh, let's see. Why haven't you mentioned PANW and Santa as BGU plays? Well, I did already, actually. In Gilmore Report on Wednesday, I talked about this one uh, as one to watch if it cleared the 200-day moving average. So, you know, that, that's one for you. If you like it, you, you play it at the 200-day moving average. Sienna is not a... Uh, Sienna looks okay. Uh, coming straight out the bottom, I'd only buy it along these lows, you know. So, and, and the other thing is I'd rather own this. Uh, or this, to tell you the truth. So, but maybe uh, 
Sienna will work out. If that's true, then look for Finisar, which announces uh, to also come around. But you haven't had anything there. So, anyways. But, you know, we're not going to talk about everything. So, stop your whining. Jeez, Louise. Ions is most perplexing. Ions? Why? It just pops back and forth. It's, I don't know. It tries to come out. I guess that's what you're talking about. It tries to break out, and then it gets popped. But, I don't know. You, you got anything on this one, Dr. K? Is this got any inside info here to offer? Not really, no. I, and that doesn't really look all that interesting to me in general. Um, I, don't, I don't see anything in it. Yes, it looks arfy. Yeah, didn't didn't do well in the last earnings report. And now it's just like creating, creating water. So somebody says SQ question mark. What about it? Is stocks extended? What do you want me to tell you? It's not doing anything bad though. It's hanging in there pretty nicely. Looks like it might even want to go higher. So, but I'm not going to buy it up here because there's no way to control your risk because you're just up there. So, I don't know. I, I, I that's kind of a dumb question to ask. Like, what, Square, what do you want us to tell you? It's way up there. The thing is, we were talking about buying it down in here. So, you know, at this point, it's not way up there. And if you own it, then you have to be thinking about where your trailing stop is. Is it the 10-day, the 20-day, or the 50-day? You know. So that's basically it. Anyways, QCOM. Do you like this here? Do I like? No, I don't really like QCOM here. I liked it down here, though. See, because you had a bottom fishing pocket pivot right here. And then uh, it just kind of slowly moved higher and launched higher. And I guess they're finishing out or getting approval for the uh, NXPI buyout. <clears throat> I don't know. Twitter seems to be rebounding better than Snap right now. Anyways, what time is it? we got about 10 minutes left. What's your source of leading stocks to search for weakness? Uh, my eye? I don't know. I just go through a lot of charts. You, you know, it's like, and I watch leading stocks. Or I, I keep, I think I've talked about this before. If you're a newbie, uh, here's a little information for you. What I do is I maintain my buy watch lists, okay? And I, and I maintain, I date them so I have, you know, buy watch lists from last year, the year before. And every time I update my watch list, I basically uh, put the old one and store it and then create a new one. And then and so I have these old watch lists. And basically what they are are, by default, uh, watch lists that would show you leaders from a few months ago, a month ago, five months ago, a year ago, two years ago. And I always go through those. And sometimes you'll see these things come up off their lows. And they'll start to set up. And usually uh, a big move is associated with some sort of a gap up move off the lows, like uh, with Ambrella last year was a great one. So, you know, that, that's what I do. And that's how I, I find ideas. Things that have broken down, especially in a rotational type of market, and are trying to recover. So I'm always looking at that. The other thing I look at is, like, you know, if I see something like this, and we were on this way early, okay, um, Momo, because this stock, it had a big move, okay, big move, then it topped up here, and it broke down, and it it had had, but it had had a big move, okay? So when it broke down, this is the breakdown on the weekly chart. So it, it had this big move, okay? And then it breaks down. So after this move, it makes sense that it's going to try and round out a base. So once it comes off the 200-day line, that's when we were on it. And if you go back and look at the webinars from back, then you will see that I was on it. And uh, I think you had a bottom fishing pocket pivot here. And then we put it on our list here. So, you know, and this is a leader that was more recent. So again, there it's the same concept. You're looking at leaders that could that have broken down on our basing. Another one that we had on our list for a long time and we kept it on was Trade Disc. Trade Desk, not Trade Disc. Uh, and this yeah, one, okay. it's still on. What? It's still on the list. Um, yeah, it's still there. Okay, and and we kept saying you want to buy it on weakness along the 50 day line. Then boom, it breaks out. It has a big move. And that was what? Was that a double? No, that was like a hundred, uh, 50 or 75 percent move, something like that. I don't know. You do the math. Okay, you're better at it. 15 percent, 50 percent, five yeah. zero. So it's a huge move, and then the thing corrects. Okay, but we're not going to tell you, oh my God, this thing is done with. It's still on our on our buy list because it's way up from where we put it on, way down here. And we let it base out, and along the lows, notice how it violates the 50-day line, and then you show a pocket pivot here, which I believe is. No, wait, where is that? No, I'm sorry, it wasn't there. Somewhere in here. One, two... Yeah, it, had, it, it had a pocket pivot. Here, right? Was that here? No, here. Before, it was on, um, it was on the, the, the fifth... Wait a minute, who's that? The fifth... 
the 4th of May. Okay. And then it also had, um, yeah, no, the 4th of May was a 10-day pocket. But then you also had a 5-day on the 2nd. And you also yeah, had a 5-day so on the, have, the 20, yeah. 27th. Right, so, so it rounded out the lows of the base and it gapped out. If you got in along the lows of 36, by the time it's up here before earnings, you probably could have tried to sit with it. Might have gotten away with it. Um, but that's what we look, you know, what you do. There's no magical screen that I run. Look at so. the memo chart again. Hard work. Look at the memo chart again. But this this applies to many of memo. these reading names. Yeah. Um, one quick way. Um, is to, you know, when the market has a pullback, you're going to see leading names have pullbacks, um, often sharp pullbacks, but they'll often pull back to their 20-day and get support. So if you, you need to be quick on the trigger, but you can see like in the case of Momo, it'll, it'll tag its 20-day and then bounce, uh, but you got to be there. Um, you know, if you're not watching your stock screen today, you can still put in a uh, buy limit uh, stop order. So in other words, you can, you can, the next day when you're not at your computer, we're watching the market, um, it'll trigger the order if it hits, you know, say within a, a certain range of the 20 day, whatever that price tag is, but then you also put a stop in. So it's, in other words, you have a limit stop. So you also have a stop order that, that will trigger if the stock should go, say, you know, two or three or 4% below where your price is triggered. So that like that you covered yourself. Um, and it works quite nicely. I mean, you don't, you know, I, I know there's some people who, you know, they can't watch the market during the day, but they're up nicely. They've been up nicely last year and then this year as well because maybe, you know, it's because they're they're not seeing from the screens all the time. Maybe it works better for them. Because I know some people will get um, off balance by watching things in real time, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, if, if, they, if they don't have a real good uh, handle on their strategy and what they're doing, uh, that can work against them. Um, so at any rate, that that uh, you know, use your use your lead, your watch list of leading stocks uh, for these types of pullbacks. Somebody asks, when you reference control your risk, you mean a stop at a moving average, correct? Well, I mean a stop as close to uh, to the your entry as possible. It doesn't necessarily have to be a moving average. So an example would be we can even use Momo today if we want to. Well, let's see. Let's sync up that. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, you know you could use the uh, this low here, at as I said, thirty-seven, thirty-two. That could be a stop, and that's pretty tight. That's like one percent below where you are here. I mean, you're a, a dime above it. So this almost seems like the place where you want to load the boat. I don't know. Hmm. But I still want to see that turn. I'd feel more comfortable if I saw it clear the fifty-day, and then I could use that as my selling guide. But I think seventeen, thirty-two, that low right here would work. So, you know, that's where you figure out your stops, not necessarily a moving average. So, um, thank you for the walkthrough of thought process of live trades today. That was helpful for me. Uh, you're welcome. <clears throat> Open oh, that person left. So they probably have something more pressing to deal with. Um, Somebody says, did Livermore have a millennial rule? You mean a millennial mark rule? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So, but he, you know, I guess that would be just an extension of the century mark rule. So I wouldn't yeah. really think I, about I, it I, your way. It, 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 think of it psychologically. The reason the, uh, the century mark works because 100 to a lot of people, it's a nice round number. And so psychologically, it's a, a place of strength on where people, you know, on where something pivotal will happen to the stock. Same for 200, 300, 400, um, and uh, you know, as you get up into the several hundreds, it probably has less of, a, of a, an effect because 700, 800 means is less meaningful than 100 or 200. But a thousand resets the clock, and I would, you know, with things like Amazon and Google who are trading right around their thousand marks, you can certainly use the century mark rule and yeah, call it the millennium mark rule. In this day and age, uh, when stocks are actually trading at, at around a thousand. Uh, Y'all might know that the only stock that traded above a thousand, I think, prior to this cycle, was the uh, Warren Buffett stock, Berkshire Halfway, and everything else was typically uh, split. By the time it got up to about 100, 150 or 200, it, they would all, always split it because the psychology was that uh, investors are more likely to buy uh, cheaper stocks than stuff that's you know, priced out to be on 200. Okay, let's see.
I can hear people. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on today. Somebody, really are, are you on the deck there? Is that what you're doing? Let's see. What's that? He's right, you're right on the beach there, so it's people walking by or something, I guess. Yeah, no, it's, it's weird because this is kind of a private beach, and it's weird to see all Well, it's construction people. Okay. <laughs> now like a lot of people. Anyways. Weird. Priceline is, uh, what about it? Yeah, Priceline's another uh, ugly duckling. See, notice how it uh, it gaps down after earnings, and of course it looks like dirt, and so it, it holds right here and uh, bounces and goes back to the upside. You, don't you love that? Um, somebody's asking, AGN has gone through the, what, the 20, 21 day SMA or something, and what, what do we think? No, you're not allowed to ask stupid questions like that. AGN, what do we think? I think you're you don't really understand how to buy a bottom, but I guess you know if you want to buy it, go for it. But it's not really a big leading stock to me. You know, it's just a big chop chop situation. So it's it's a big slow name. So I don't you know it doesn't have the dynamism say of an NTNX, which is a little more well formed along the lows. So you know I don't know. I think you're grasping at straws there. Anyways, yes. I think we're done for today. So trying to give you some idea of how you know, operate on a day like today. And, uh, you know, the basic concept of just watching the setups in this market and see if we keep going higher. You know, I guess, I suppose you could reverse and sell off any time. I figured that was a possibility today, but it didn't happen. So that's not a problem, though. Uh, there are plenty of stocks pulling into position to buy. So, you know, you just come in on those. And uh, the names I was long this morning went down, even though the indexes went up, so I could buy them all back at 20 or 30 or 40 cents cheaper than I sold them this morning before the open. So that, that works out. So I kind of like the NTNX, still looking good. Let's see. Let's just review these before we sign up. Now, you're up there, so you came up really fast, and uh, see how it holds up. But it looks okay. And let's see, Momo is trying to regain its Momo. And it's just kind of coming down. You're getting even stretchier. So you might watch for a MACD stretch and cross. Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it goes through 37, 32 and dies. I don't know. But we'll see. So, um, And then we've got Snap is trying to hold. I, I'm guessing, what's the volume rate right now, Dr. K? Snap is at minus 60%. So it's still drying up. You could just have some sellers. It's what, second day of the month? You could just have some sellers getting out of the way, and then it will lift on you. And probably when it lifts, it will gap up on Monday. But it's just kind of drifting lower. Looks a little bit like Momo, although Momo's trying to turn here. I bet you I'm going to bet that Momo ends up turning back to the upside, if not today, in the next few days, because just because this looks like you should be selling it. And I'm sure everybody sees it, and they're selling it, because, oh, my God, it's under the 50-day line, and it's going to blow. And they're just going to fake them out. It's going to be a moving average undercut and rally. So the other safe way to play it is wait for it to come back above the moving average. Then use that, the 50-day, at 37.76 as your stop. But I'd also watch, you know, the MACD stretch and cross here. Because uh, now you're getting a position where you could turn. So, you know, just kind of keep an eye on that if you like it. It was a hot name, but, you know, maybe Bowsen becomes the new hot name. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe Weibo pulls in and holds up and Baba and... Uh, you got netties, and <clears throat> that looks like it might be trying to set up again. It's in a, it looks kind of coherent on the weekly, less so on the daily, a little bit choppy, but I think along the 20-day, that's probably your best entry spot. But anyways, those, those are our thoughts on some of these names. And, uh, you know, I say just stick with the focus list, which has been a very strong uh, list of names. We, almost, we thought about ad adding this this morning. My, my thinking was we, we probably should have, Dr. K, but... Whatever, it's extended, and the list is already doing so well that it seems to me you don't want to buy extended names. And, yeah, they could work. So if you see a Bible gap up like that, yeah, you could try and play it, just like with the others that, you know, I went over. Oh, there was, a, there was box, box yesterday. Um, AALI, we eventually got on. Which one? But uh, it was box yesterday, oh, but that box, was... Uh, yeah, there's another one. Whoops. BOX. Yeah, and see how it has a big update, but then it sells in, and so I'm more inclined to want to uh, just keep hang with them and see, uh, you know, see if they pull into the lows of the uh, viable gap, especially if they've already had a big move, you know. And Box has come a long ways off its lows down here. So, anyways. You might be better, right. better buying as it pulls back here. Yeah. Um, but AOI, that was an interesting one because 
because the thing, this market, the thing is, the market changes very fast on a dime. And on intraday, I remember when I mentioned this, you were sorting it, but you were going for a smaller, you know, micro time frame, and then eventually we put it on, um, and it's done well, you know. But uh, it's 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 important to stress that everyone realizes a lot of the best names are going to be very quick on the trigger, and you got to have fast reaction time, especially yeah. those ones that pull back to the 20-day on market pullbacks, because the market tends to correct and find a floor and then move higher generally in, in the same day. So uh, the best stocks will do that, will, will also mimic that kind of um, market action in their yeah. own charts. All right, good enough. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Have a great weekend. Uh, it's only a two-day weekend, unfortunately. Well, actually, fortunately, I hate long weekends because in the market is closed for three days instead of two, but uh, two days I can handle. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. <laughs> so, I don't know. Life just isn't exciting unless the market's open, right? Is that sick? I don't know. All right, you guys, thanks for showing up. Have a great week, and we'll catch you next week. Take care. So long, everyone.